Hebrews chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, and verse 12 to 15. It says, And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Verse 12, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Now, it sounds like those scriptures are saying that if you're a believer in Christ and you don't hold on to your faith all the way up to the end of your life, well, it sounds like it's saying that, well, then you just lose your salvation. Um, you know, you, you're just not saved anymore and you have to endure to the end in order to be saved. And that's not what these scriptures are saying. It sounds like that's what they're saying, but it's not what they're saying. And if you are a faithful and a true and a responsible student of the word, you will know that you have to put scripture in context in order to interpret it. You cannot just lift verses out of the Bible and uh, that, that sound like they're saying something and then just say, well, that's what they say. No, to be faithful, you have to put them in their proper context, read around the chapters uh, in order to be faithful to that scripture. If you're a genuine student, then you want to be faithful to the word of God. And so we need to be faithful to these verses and say what they are truly saying, not saying not say what we want them to say. There's a lot of people that want you to believe you can lose your salvation and they want you to believe that if you don't endure to the end, keeping your faith, you can be saved, unsaved, saved, you know, one minute saved, next minute lose it, you know, and that's all not true. So what is the context of these verses in Hebrews? Well, you really have to read uh, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and chapter four, which obviously I don't have enough time to do in this short clip, um, so I'm just going to mention a few things and hopefully it creates enough of a context uh, so that we can see what these scriptures are really talking about. I, I believe that um, the writer of Hebrews is speaking to Hebrew people, not necessarily a church or any church in particular, but he's speaking to the nation of Jews, of Hebrews, and um, and he's addressing them. And some sometimes... Uh, it's addressing born-again believers, and sometimes it's addressing those that are not born again, that are still under the law, that are rejecting Christ, that are refusing to come into Christ. And I believe, actually, you see that right throughout the book of Hebrews. Uh, it's, it's, it's constantly speaking to two main groups of people. It speaks to those that have heard about Jesus, that are, that are Jews that have heard about Jesus, but have rejected Christ as the Messiah, and, uh, and then are actually persecuting those who have persecuting the Jews who have received Jesus as Messiah. Um, and so the writer is speaking to Hebrews that have rejected Christ, and he's speaking to Hebrews that have received Christ. And so a lot of the book of Hebrews is uh, a threat, and a lot of the book of Hebrews is an encouragement. And the writer, you can see, he is threatening those who have heard about Christ, they've heard the gospel, they've heard that Christ is the Messiah, yet they reject him as the Messiah. And a lot of the book of Hebrews is a threat to these people saying, if you continue to reject Christ, there is going to be um, judgment and fiery indignation from God for the enemies of God. And, and then he's also, it's an encouragement to believers who do believe in Christ. They have received the Messiah and they're trying to walk uh, this life of faith. And yet they're facing persecution from the Jews that have rejected Christ, that are still embracing the law and are angry at um, Jews for leaving the law and receiving Christ. And so they are persecuting them. And so the writer writes to encourage them, saying, hold on to your faith. Don't throw it away so easily. Don't go back to the law, but, but walk in faith. You can be confident in faith because Jesus is a superior mediator of a better covenant. Um, he is far greater than Moses. He is superior Grace is superior to the law. The new covenant is more superior to the old covenant. Jesus' high priesthood is far superior to the Levitical priesthood. Um, the, the heavenly temple is far superior to the earthly temple. There's a lot of contrast that happens in the book of 
Hebrews. And so the writer encourages believers saying, you can be confident, you can stand firm and you can stand fast in this hope that you have because it is true hope. It is real hope. It is awesome hope. And um, so the context of these verses, um, if we stand firm to the end, if we hold on to the confidence that we had in the beginning all the way to the end, um, what is that talking about? Well, um, I believe that it is, it is, it's talking to uh, the Jewish people that have rejected Christ. They've heard that there was a coming Messiah. Um, that you know, Hebrews always grew up under the law. They they grew up with faith in a coming Messiah that would one that would one day come and save them from their sins and would deliver them, you know, once and for all, and would end. You know, the, all the temple, the sacrifices and all of that. But Jesus would be a, a, that would save them from the fear of death. You know, all their life they lived in fear of death. And there was hope in a coming Messiah who would deliver them and would save them, uh, who was the seed of Abraham. You know, God made promises to Abraham and, um, and, that, and he promised that through his seed, uh, all nations on earth would be blessed. All nations would become righteous. All nations would be saved. And so Hebrews lived with this promise and this faith in a future Messiah. And uh, so then when the Messiah came, you know, then they rejected him. They rejected Jesus. And so they weren't holding fast their confession from the beginning to the end. They, they started off believing in this coming Messiah. But then when the Messiah came, they didn't confess him as the Messiah. And they actually, and in doing that, they rejected the Messiah. In doing that, they were uh, departing from the living God. Because when God reveals himself as uh, Messiah, God as Jesus as Messiah, if you reject Messiah, if you reject God, then you are departing from the living God. You were walking, believing in a Messiah, but then the Messiah came and you you rejected him and you walked a different way. Now you're departing from the living God. In Hebrews chapter 1, it spends a lot of time speaking about Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the, and, and that he came in the flesh, and that he came for the sins of the world, and that he was a superior, glorious, um, awesome Savior, greater than angels, greater than Moses. Uh, he was the living God that came in the flesh. It spends a lot of time speaking about Jesus, the Messiah, who has come. And, he's, and, and the writer is saying this to the Hebrews, saying, guys, the Messiah has come. Now receive him. Um, Hebrews chapter 2, it, it starts off, you know, straight after chapter 1, it says, Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. He's saying, in other words, the gospel has been preached. Christ has come. Now, now you need to give yourself to that. You need to embrace that. And if you don't, you're going to drift away. How do you drift away? How do you depart from the living God? He's saying, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, uh, which was first, uh, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to um, his own will. So in other words, the gospel Jesus came, presented himself as the Messiah. Uh, you know, the apostles preached the gospel and confirmed that he was the Messiah. God even confirmed that he was the Messiah uh, through works of the Holy Spirit, through signs and wonders. And, and so he's saying to the Hebrew people, come on, guys, there's been so many witnesses. There's been so many proofs and convincing evidences that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Now, don't neglect him. Don't uh, resist Jesus. Don't reject the Messiah. You need to accept and embrace the Messiah. Um, and and then, uh, you know, it, chapter two goes into a lot of detail again, just reinforcing that Christ is the Messiah. He came to, to uh, set us apart from our sins, to take us out of the old covenant, bring us into the new covenant. Um, and so we must receive him. And then Chapter 3 says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. You know, all of the Hebrews have been called to heaven. We partake, they were partakers of the heavenly calling. It says, um, Consider 
the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. He's saying, consider Christ. Consider him. Don't reject him. Consider him. He is he is the high priest and apostle of our confession. He says, you know, before Christ came, our confession was a future Messiah. Now Jesus has come. Continue in your confession. Christ is the Messiah. Consider Jesus the high priest of our confession. In verse three, in verse three, he says, "For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses." Um, and so they were still holding on to Moses. These Hebrews, they were, they, they didn't want to depart from Moses. They didn't want to leave Moses and leave the law and come into Christ and come into grace. And and he's and the writer is saying, "No, Jesus is greater than Moses. He is more powerful, more superior than Moses. Leave Moses, come into Christ." And then verse six, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Um, some of the earlier manuscripts didn't say firm to the end. Um, it just said uh, whose house we are, if we hold fast and confidence, the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope. In other words, we are Christ's house. We have come into Christ. We belong to Christ if we hold fast, if we hold on to Christ, if if we have confidence in Christ, if we put our hope in Christ, then we are Christ. It's not saying, you know, if if you endure and have faith to the end. The context is you are you belong to Christ. You are part of his house if you are holding on to Christ and not rejecting Christ. And then the the verses after that the writer is saying, you know, today, if if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion, in the day of trial, in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. I, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not uh, enter my rest. And then uh, uh, verse 15, it says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in uh, the rebellion. And, uh, and th- this is, this, the writer is speaking about uh, Hebrews that was delivered, the, the Jewish nation that was uh, delivered from Egyptian slavery and bondage. And uh, God's intent and promise was for them to go into uh, the promised land. And uh, they failed to go in. Why? Because of evil hearts of unbelief. And th- they did not believe what they heard about God. They did not believe the promises. Um, and so he's, he's using uh, this illustration to, to speak of present day is- Israel, the present day Israel of those times and saying, you've heard the gospel. Um, now combine what you've heard with faith and go into the promised land. You've heard of the coming Messiah. You heard that he was coming. Now he has come. The gospel has been preached. Jesus preached it himself. The apostles preached it. The Holy Spirit confirmed it with signs. You have heard the gospel. Now go into the promised land. Go come. Go into Christ. Go into the land of rest. Enter into the land of rest. Enter into Christ's rest. And so you see verse 14, it says, For we have become partakers of Christ. We have become partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. And straight away after that, he says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. So we've become partakers of Christ. If we hold our confidence, the confidence we had in the beginning, firm to the end. In other words, we believed in the coming Messiah. Our confession was in the coming Messiah. That was our confidence. Oh, the Messiah is coming. We are confident in that. Now the Messiah has come. He's saying, stay confident. Keep your confidence in this Messiah, in the true Messiah, Jesus Christ. Because when you put your confidence and your faith in him, then you are partakers in Christ. And chapter four is all about, you know, telling them you still need to enter into rest. There are many that have heard the gospel that have, that have, that just like Israel, they didn't combine it with faith and therefore they failed to go into the land of rest, the promised land. He's saying just like modern day uh, Israel, you've heard the gospel, you've heard that Christ has come, but you are failing to go into it because you're not combining the message you're hearing with faith. 
He's saying you need to combine the message you're hearing with faith so that you can go into Christ, come go into the land of rest. In chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. So this is a threat to, to modern day Israel that are rejecting the Messiah. They still wanting to live under the Lord. He's saying, guys, you need a fear. You are in a bad situation. If you do not turn to Christ, you are not going to enter into the land of rest, the promised land. You're not going to go to heaven. He says, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well to them. It was preached to modern day Israel as it was to those in the wilderness. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those that heard it. Um, for we who have believed do enter that rest. So it's only those that believe in Christ, that receive Christ, that enter into rest. And he says, verse 6, Since therefore it remains that some must enter it. So he's speaking to Hebrews. He's saying, guys, the reality is a lot of you haven't entered into uh, Christ and his rest. And it still remains that some of you need to enter into it. You, you, you had a confession of a future coming Messiah. Now that Messiah has come, you need to embrace that Messiah. You need to hold fast your confession that you had in the beginning. You need to hold it to the end. First, you believe in the coming Messiah. Now Christ has come. Believe in the Messiah who has come. That Otherwise, you're going to depart from the faith since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, before it says because of an evil heart of unbelief, because of the sin, the sin was, they were hardened by sin, the sin of unbelief, um, that which, which was disobedience, disobedience is unbelief, and because of unbelief, because of that sin of unbelief, they did not enter into the promised land into interest. And he's saying to the Hebrews, if you have a sinful heart that is hardened by the by unbelief, by self-righteousness, by wanting to hold on to the law and reject Christ, he says you are going to fail to enter into the promised land. And verse 11, um, verse 9 says, There remains therefore a rest for the people of God, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his Verse 11, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience as Israel. So you can see that the context, he's speaking to Hebrews, he's saying, be careful that, that you are saved. Make sure you are saved. Make sure that you have um, put your confidence and your hope in Christ. Because when you do that, you become a partaker in Christ. When you believe in, when you receive Christ as the Messiah, then you will enter into his rest. When you enter into his rest, then you cease from your own works. You cease from your own labor. You cease from works-based righteousness. You need to leave the law. You need to leave works and you need to put your faith in Christ um, and come into the rest of Christ. Come into the promised land, which is salvation. It's eternal life. It is life in Christ. So I hope that I've explained that clear enough. Um, I think we covered quite a lot of ground there. And um, I think I repeated some things quite a lot. But uh, hopefully uh, the context becomes clear to you. Uh, it is not saying that, you know, you need to be so careful that you hold on to Christ. It's like, it's it, that, that, otherwise you're going to lose your salvation. That just puts believers in fear. Um, and God's way of motivating us and causing us to live, it, it says the righteous shall live by faith. It doesn't say the righteous will live by fear, fear of losing salvation. So I need to be so careful that I don't lose. No, we've got to live this life confident. Okay, how, can, how do we do that? Well, we know our salvation is secure in Christ. We are born again. He is the one holding our salvation. And so we can have confidence in this life. We can have boldness in this life. You know, we can face persecution. We can face intimidation. We can face attacks. And uh, we don't have to throw away our confidence and throw away and, and abandon our faith. No, we can continue to be strong in our faith, walk confidently in this life, because we have such a secure hope in Christ. And uh, so that's the encouragement 
part of the book of Hebrews, uh, where he's encouraging believers, saying, you know, come on, guys, let's let's endure through persecution. Don't shrink back. Don't be discouraged. But you have Christ on your side. He is your high priest. He is your eternal mediator. He ever lives to intercede for you. And you can just have boldness in him. And, and you can endure through anything because he is with you. You are with him. And um, so that's the encouragement. So I hope that puts it in context. And uh, maybe go back and read uh, chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4. And hopefully you will see that what I've, what I've just said will just start to fall into place. And you'll be able to help others with that too. God bless.